Welcome back, everyone. Revelations came late last week, as you all know, that J.P. Morgan had suffered more than $2 billion in trading losses. Now, armed with that information, two shareholders now suing the company and its top execs, alleging that they misled investors about the company's investment exposure. The issue has caused some to ask if more regulation could have saved the day. Well, joining us now to break down what might have happened uh, behind the scenes of J.P. Morgan, Anthony Curry, columnist for Reuters. And Anthony, I appreciate a few minutes. Thank you very much. Yeah, pleasure. Thanks for having me. You know, one of the things I saw that you wrote um, was where this happened within J.P. Morgan um, as a division yep. within the bank and what that says. Um, and, and to that end, did it scream that they themselves didn't know really what their exposure was and what was going on with, once again, derivatives? Or is it that this whole issue of transparency or honesty with themselves, with regulators, and with investors, that was put on the back burner? What do we know that they knew? Well, we, we don't know a huge amount about what they know, apart from the fact, obviously, they've had these losses and that they feel, as, as Jamie Dimon has, says continually, he's got his big mayor culpa. We, we, we went overboard on this. We weren't uh, probably looking at this. We weren't monitoring it properly. It's unacceptable. But it's, it's very hard to know exactly what went wrong at the moment. They keep playing a lot of their cards close to their chest. But, but I mean, to, to your first point about where it happened in the bank, this is one of the most core units of, of the bank. It's, it's not as if it's some rogue trader way off in some desk on the trading desk in the investment bank. This is uh, one of the core functions of the Treasury division of the firm, which looks after the entire balance sheet. So this is where you go to make sure that the entire firm has its risks properly monitored and hedged. And the person who ran that, who, who uh, so-called retired at the beginning of this week, Ina Drew, uh, she was uh, one of the top five people of the firm uh, in terms of uh, the, the named executives you give to the SEC. And she was one of the top uh, paid executives at the firm, earning about 15 million over each of the past two years. And she rather unusually reported directly to Jamie Dimon. Normally someone in her position would report to the CFO or the chief risk officer. So there is a case now to wonder, well, was she in fact not properly monitored because Jamie Dimon has too many other things on his plate? Should she have gone through the risk officer or the finance chief? And in fact, even was she left in the job too long? Jamie Dimon is a big fan of moving people around, and yet she was in that unit for a lot longer than most other executives at the bank apart from himself. You know, it was interesting. A month earlier, um, I know you know this, but our audience says there was the there yeah. was the quarterly meeting where, among others, the CFO, Doug Brownstein, addressed folks about where their positions were and how secure they were. But he said yeah. something specifically about how compliant they were and how transparent they were. Quote, he said, we're very comfortable with our positions as they're held today. And I'd add that all of those positions are fully transparent to the regulators. They review them, have access to them at any point in time. Does that mean here that the regulars, regulators couldn't figure this out here? They knew or they didn't understand it or that they really didn't make the books as open as he's, as he's alleging? Well, it, it, it could be either. I think actually to give JP Morgan some credit, they have been one of the more open uh, banks on Wall Street over the last few years. Granted, that's not saying a huge amount. Um, but one, of the, one of the big problems here is that regulators uh, really are severely understaffed. So if you look at, I mean, forget about whether the rules are right or wrong uh, and w what disclosures are out there. There are about 40 or 50 regulators sitting at most of these big banks looking at their books. And they're looking at tens, if not hundreds of thousands of trades per day around the world. So there has to be a they need a way of, of catching something that's going horribly wrong. And for that, unfortunately, they're going to be relying to a great extent on uh, a lot of the bank's models. Now, you, what you'd like to see is that they actually do come up with some of their own questions. So as soon as this, uh, we had what Bloomberg and, and the Wall Street Journal came out with the, the, their reports in March or early April saying this CIO unit, this chief investment, uh, investment office unit we're looking at, uh, has built up positions of up to 100 billion in, um, in derivatives in Europe on, on corporate credit. Well, the first question you think a regulator would ask, regardless of the models, is, well, wait, that's 100 billion. That's about 10% of JP Morgan's overall balance sheet. Should we be worried about that? What happened? next. So regardless of anything else, you're going to hope that, that regulators will latch on to that. Let me ask you a question about culture here and, and what has actually changed. Most of my audience, Anthony, uh, they either got a 401k, they got an IRA, and frankly, after the mm -hmm. first paragraph, they say, what can I do about it? This is above my pay grade necessarily. But I was looking at numbers. 1970, the five biggest banks in this country, they had about 17% total of the market. 
Now the five biggest banks in this country have more than half of the market and the whole too big to fail. There seemingly is a sense that if anything, they're positioned stronger now, that God forbid something happened to J.P. Morgan, what really could be done? We couldn't let them just go under like we did with Lehman. Has anything changed in the culture of big risk, short-term rewards, or even this idea that, hey, unless they bring back uh, Glass-Steagall here, unless they break up the big banks, nothing mm -hmm. really is going to change at the end of the day? Well, so some things have changed. But it's, it's the really large institutions and those that are not federally insured, so regular investment banks, uh, where we've got a problem with, with, with how to wind them up. And the FDIC thinks it's getting there. It said, look, what we'll do is in a crisis, if it gets really that bad, we will transfer a lot of uh, the debt that these companies owe into equity so that that then, uh, or the, the debt that they have in their balance sheet into equity to help support them in a crisis. And that's a sort of a capital management issue that can help. Uh, but it's really untested how to do this, obviously. We've never mm -hmm. seen that happen. So, I mean, it's, I, the, the one, is there a way around it by making banks smaller? You could do that, but then you open yourself up to other risks. As I said, with regulators being somewhat overwhelmed, that's a very difficult thing to be comfortable with. It's not uh, certainly a simple answer. I got about 10 seconds here, Anthony. Does your gut tell you, and from what you've heard in the street, that they really think between now and the election, real reform, whether it's a Volcker rule, whether it's some version of Glass-Eagle, something with teeth is going to get fast-tracked in Washington, or are we going to forget about this story in the next, you know, two, three, four weeks? Mm. I don't think we're going to forget about it, but I think the chances of getting anything of any significance on any topic through Congress year, this year is pretty slim, especially on regulation. Anthony, thank you so much for a few minutes. I appreciate it. Pleasure. Thanks for having me on the show.